our host, Vanessa. So a long time ago, Vanessa was in the middle school here at Lausanne American School, and she was one of those students who really stuck out uh, with her personality and her drive and her willingness to really be a student leader. Um, back in that first year of that particular experience, we showed the film about High Tech High uh, down in our local theater and had quite a few people there. And then we tried to model our middle school after that, uh, some of the ideas in that film. So it's sort of a Nice pleasure to have uh, somebody here from there who Vanessa now, as a university student, uh, will introduce. Yes, thank you, Dr. Magnuson. So good morning, afternoon or night, depending on where you are right now. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have the honor to introduce a very special speaker. Having lived in Chicago, LA, San Diego, China, San Francisco, Costa Rica, and Jacksonville, she has been able to develop an international mindset that has become key to her work. In college, she was focusing on taking ethnic studies courses. And one day, when she watched a documentary of boys in East LA that showed how education and economic disparity were so tightly interconnected, she became instantly inspired for social change, and now she has been working in education for over 25 years. Not only is she an inspiring entrepreneur, but she's also the founding director of High Tech High International and a key member of the founding leadership team at the High Tech High Graduate School of Education, where she currently serves as the dean. But wait, there's more. She's also a first generation college student and the mother of three children who, of course, all attend High Tech High. <laughs> Driven by social justice, a true believer that education can be a lever for social change and passionate for reimagining education for young people based on technology and innovation, Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you, Dr. Kelly Wilson. Wow, thank you, Vanessa. That was, that was really wonderful. We were, Paul, um, it's been so wonderful to be here in Laysan and be a visiting scholar. And Paul connected us prior to the talk to have a conversation. And um, if other students are anything like Vanessa, it's such a beautiful <laughs> testament to the work um, that happens here. So thank you so much. Like she said, I'm Kelly Wilson. Um, it's really an honor and privilege to be here today and share a little bit about High Tech High and very humbling to see how High Tech High has impacted others around the world that are engaged and really shared purpose and work in trying to reimagine education um, grounded in equity, innovation, and deeper learning. So I will share my screen. I will try to stay within the 12 minutes as best as I can, no promises. I'm gonna move this where it's not in the way. So um, like she said, uh, I'm Kelly Wilson. I've been part of the High Tech High community since 2002. High Tech High opened in 2000, can we move that away for me? Um, with one high school and no plans to expand into anything beyond that. Um, and we now have 16 schools and an embedded graduate school of education. And I've had the honor and privilege of being a math physics robotics teacher at the founding high school, opening the second high school, starting a graduate school and working for quite a long time with our master's students in educational leadership and now serving as the Dean. Um, and like Vanessa said, I have three kids that are part of High Tech High. So also I get to see um, the community with my parent hat. My oldest is um, going off to college next year. So I'll share a little bit more. Okay, I might have to minimize this to be, okay. So I just wanna start off with sharing a little bit about what problem High Tech High was trying to disrupt when it started in 2000. And one thing that uh, folks were noticing in San Diego and really around the world, San Diego started with a conversation between uh, business technology leaders in San Diego and educators that felt like they were pumping money and change ideas into a system that was really an outdated factory model of schooling and that the systems were designed to get the results they were getting. And what they were seeing from the business sector and seeing from within San Diego 
is a lot of um, inequity in outcomes, who was going to college, um, who was successful in completing high school, and more so who was also not equipped following high school and college with critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration skills, these skills that were not yet called 21st century skills, um, really not coming into the workplace with those skills. So they wanted to disrupt that, that outdated factory uh, model of schooling and also the ways that our schools tend to perpetuate equity. They also were looking at how we might disrupt the focus on breadth over depth. We hadn't talked about the term deeper learning until about 2013, but really deeper learning and going deep into fewer topics and knowing those well and being able to apply those ideas that you're learning to novel situations, to create and construct new knowledge, and to really disrupt this idea that schooling is about memorization and content regurgitation. And so the deeper learning competencies that we now talk about often at High Tech High and with the other kind of network of deeper learning schools is how do we not only master uh, core academic content, but how do we teach young people how to think critically to solve complex problems um, with the ever-changing world and the issues that we're facing around economic injustice, climate justice? How do we um, how do we create innovators that can help us create a better future? How can they work in groups collaboratively, um, communicate effectively, and how do they have agency in their learning um, to learn how to learn and to develop academic mindsets like having belonging, shared purpose in the work, having agency over their work, and developing a growth mindset. So when we were reimagining K-12 education, um, there was a big focus with Rob Reardon and Larry Rosenstock, our co-founders, on the three integrations. And in order to create these three integrations, we had to ignore a few things that are really common in K-12 education. And one is that schools should separate students, students according to perceived academic ability. And we know that when we separate and sort students into academic tracks, too often you'll see trends in socioeconomic status, education level of the parents, racial identity, and that can perpetuate um, inadvertently inequity in schooling. So at High Tech High, we integrate students from all backgrounds into the same classes and cohorts of students um, in mixed um, heterogeneous classrooms. We also wanted to ignore this mindset that we're, schooling should really separate hands and minds and discipline. So Larry and Rob had been working at a school in Boston that had been around for over a century. And there was an academic track of students working with their minds that were headed off to college. And then a separate vocational track of students working with their hands, um, making, learning, building, doing, created but not necessarily in a college bound track. So we were clear that we wanted all students to have access to college and go to college, but they would be working with their hands and minds through project-based learning and that we would blur the discipline. So rather than going to separate classes throughout the day with separate content learning, that there would be projects as a unifying way to help students think with their mind, use their hands, create something of value to them and the community um, and do that in an interdisciplinary way. And then that we wanted to um, really break down the four walls of the classroom and not separate school from the world in which students already exist and are about to enter as young adults um, and really have them tackling problems and questions that professionals are grappling with. So High Tech High is grounded on four design principles. I'll briefly um, touch on these. The first is equity. We have a blind zip code based lottery. So our students reflect the surrounding community by uh, socioeconomic status, racial diversity. About 50% of students qualify for free and reduced lunch and about 70% um, identify as students of color. We're diverse, but also purposely integrated, no tracking. Um, projects are a way that we think about designing challenge and access for students because there's multiple entry points into the learning and that we have a college going culture for all. Um, the second design principle is personalization and really at the heart of that is relationships. We've grown from one school to 16 schools and four campuses, elementary, middle and high, but each school is small um, with no more than about 400 and 500 students, for example, at the high school level. Um, we build those relationships through small class size, collaborative learning environments. We have advisory 
um, that students are part of multiple times a week and they stay with that same advisor from ninth grade through 12th grade. We do home visits at the entry points of sixth grade and 12th, uh, sorry, ninth grade as you're entering middle and high school where the advisor comes to the family's home to get to know the family um, and really is an advocate throughout that whole um, learning experience. Um, and then project design is another way that we think about providing voice and choice in the project. So students might be um, pursuing a similar topic, but they might have different essential questions or different ways of sharing their learning. Um, the third is authentic work. So engaging uh, students in work that matters, not because it's part of a prescribed curriculum or is going to be on a test, but authentic work that engages them in issues facing their community um, through interdisciplinary projects. In 11th grade, many of those project, part, uh, projects have field work components, community partnerships. And then in the 11th grade, we get our students out for month long internships. And in the 12th grade, um, they're out in the community doing um, a self directed project during Ender session that could be another internship or it could be a project that they propose and have approved by faculty. And then we have a culture of critique and revision that we're not doing work for a grade, but we're doing work to create our best, most beautiful work. And so if they're doing a piece of writing that's gonna be published in a book, we build in opportunities for peer critique and revision um, from other students, also feedback from instructors and also from the community. Um, so they're very proud of their work um, when it gets to the final point of exhibition where they make that learning public. And then the fourth design principle is collaborative design. And this is really about disrupting traditional notions of hierarchy within school, that school is not done to students, but it's done with students. So teachers and students co-design projects together. We involve students and teachers in shared leadership, shared decision-making to guide school improvement. And the way we approach professional learning, there's four days a week that has built in professional learning and collaboration time for teachers. And that's most often te teacher designed and teacher led um, in pursuing um, inquiry questions and aspects of practice they wanna improve or getting feedback on student work, tuning projects um, and talking about supporting students. So that's a, that's a snapshot. I wanted to show you an example of the High Tech High Design Principles in Action by highlighting a project. Um, this project beyond the crossfire was created, uh, designed and facilitated by an alum from our master's programs, which I'll talk about um, next. And I think it's a beautiful example of what um, high quality projects can look like. So this project occurred at a moment in time where a group of junior students had lost a peer to gun violence um, in the community and a teacher had lost her goddaughter Aviel to gun violence um, at Newtown in the school shooting. And so this particular group of students and teachers was really impacted by what was happening in our country in the US context, why was gun violence increasing and why were young people the targets of that gun violence um, far too often. And so the first design principle, I'm gonna start from the bottom and work my way up. Collaborative design, this was truly co-designed with students. Um, there's a video of this, but they got together at lunch one day and we're just processing all of these various events. And the students said, we wanna do a project where we can better understand why gun violence is happening and what we might do to stop it. And they chose to do um, an investigation and documentary film. Um, so this was an authentic issue that their, their local community was grappling with and also our broader context in the US. And they raised $25,000 on Kickstarter because they wanted to get professional um, videoing equipment and they wanted to work with professionals to be trained on how to create a documentary. And so those resources were brought in, the students did a campaign, they fundraised for their project. And then um, they had choice within the project. So it was personalized. Different groups could, after doing research and writing some um, research papers on the root causes of gun violence, they chose topics and in groups explored how they could learn more about those topics. So anything from how peer mentoring um, programs can support youth that are in inner city areas that are highly impacted by gun violence. Um, to understanding brain health and the impacts that has um, on young people. And equity was a strong focus um, of the project throughout. So I share that as an example, um, but I also um, will share the links to the slides with you, but there you can see a lot more high-tech, high projects in a book we have called Changing the Subject, which you can order or also just look at online. And it's an archive of 20 projects um, 
from our schools are worth looking at. And we also have a link to some PBL resources that you can look at. So where did we go from this one high school? This is the San Diego area. Um, Point Loma, which is near the water, you'll see is where our first high school started. And then we've grown from the one high school in 2000 to 16 schools, like I mentioned, across four campuses. And that growth happened over a period of 18 years. And then, um, and each campus has at least one elementary, middle, and high school. The Point Loma campus actually has two elementary, two middle, and three high schools. And then we, um, in 2007, started the Graduate School of Education, and we are, to our knowledge, the first Graduate School of, ed of Education in the U.S. to merge out of and to be fully embedded within K-12 schools. So there were prior schools that were connected to universities as lab schools that were started by the university, but we were the first to um, be embedded in, within and emerge out of um, a K-12 context. So a little bit about the graduate school and then we will open a time for questions. So what problem was High Tech High trying to disrupt? Um, it's kind of an outdated ivory tower model of education where K-12 and higher education are separate traditional notions of how knowledge is constructed and shared. So we really wanted teachers to be a big part of knowledge construction through their own research in collaboration with university. And then the disconnect often that novice teachers feel when they're learning about really exciting theory in graduate education, but not seeing that practice in their schools. So I'll share these. Um, we thought about three integrations that we were gonna ignore rather than separating theory and practice as much as we could integrate the two. Um, making sure that our professors were not separate from the daily lived experiences of practitioners in the field they were serving. So most are current teacher leaders, school leaders, district leaders, systems leaders, and not wanting to separate research from practitioners' efforts to improve student outcomes in school and beyond. So we have an action research model that's evolved into a continuous improvement model, but we're not just trying to study and understand things. We're trying to study, understand, and then make improvements and create change through the research that we do. So a little bit about the mission here um, that we're really trying, the graduate school was started because we knew we weren't gonna grow more schools, but we wanted to have a broader impact by developing change leaders that could disrupt the, disrupt the status quo. And we do that by thinking a lot about how innovation, equity, and improvement can all work together to improve um, outcomes for students, really keeping students at the center. So I'll share quickly just a little bit about the graduate school, and then we'll leave that open for questions. We have two master's programs. Um, one is a San Diego teacher residency program. The first year you earn your credential. The second, in your first year of your teaching, you are finishing up an MED in teaching and learning. Um, with action research um, and lesson study cycles you're doing in your classroom. And then an MED in educational leadership that is online or in person and can be done over one or two years. And the capstone is a continuous improvement project focused on leadership. And you can see a little bit about, we have about 353 alum and 55% that identify as BIPOC. We also have a center for research um, on equity and innovation where we're doing a lot of work with network improvement communities that are trying to disrupt predictable patterns of success and failure in schools by bringing more innovative student-centered deeper learning into their schools. So they'll get together, often it could be 20 to 25 schools over a, you know, a broader geographic area that come together three times a year, they get online support, they have coaching, but they look at shared aims of what do we want to improve what are our ideas for change and how will we know if those changes lead to improvement? And we've worked on things from um, equity in math classrooms and developing belonging to college access. And we've had about almost 700 participants and again, a very diverse group. And I've got a link if you wanna learn more about the research center. Um, in 2020, in the wake of George Floyd and kind of the racial reckoning, we were looking at what else we could do to center liberatory learning and justice in our work. And we launched the Center for Love and Justice. And they partner with existing schools and districts and also new school founders to um, support school redesign and also new schools that um, really focus on student leadership and activating student voice learning through projects that are not only innovative, but also liberatory, and then making that learning public. And they have a 
a framework for equity stances that they use that you're welcome to take a look at um, to really think about the intersection of critical pedagogy and project-based learning. And then we have a host of other things we do from hosting visits, um, having online offerings, uh, PBL Design Camps, a deeper learning conference where we work with educators, not in our research networks or in our master's programs. And one more slide. Um, the last that I just want to share, we do have a online journal called Unboxed, where we have articles, podcasts, videos. And again, this is, um, they are peer reviewed. And also there are a lot coming from the field, from students, from teachers. Um, and so we encourage you, if you're interested to share this with others and have folks um, email ideas to Alec Patton, who um, is the, the lead for that work. Um, and you can access all of that material online as well. Um, great. So I've, I probably went over my 12 minutes, hopefully not too bad, <laughs> um, but I'd love to open it up for questions um, and I will take off screen share so you can see you all. Um, but that was a little, I'm going to give you a flavor of just who we are, how we got started, what we were trying to disrupt in education as we were reimagining K-12 and then also as we extended out into the graduate school what our vision is. I'll kind of open it up for questions from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, we should give her a round of applause, of virtual applause. <laughs> um, I guess I have a question. So what's your end goal with, with High Tech High? Is it um, expanding it to to the whole nation or maybe taking it to the same model to developing countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a beautiful question. And it's, it, it goes back to our history, I think also in the early, like around 2005, six, when charters were really taking off in the United States, we had a lot of pressure and encouragement from funders and from the field to open up high tech high to be a national international model. And we made a conscious decision not to do that. We found it's challenging enough to do 16 schools well in San Diego, and we're able to drive to, you know, I think the campuses are anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half away from each other. Some are as close as 20 minutes, but all the directors can come together in person at least once a week. We can travel out and see our teaching residents. And so we want that to be something we do well and do right by the students that we serve and families, and that we have that as a not a model because we leak oil every day. We talk about wanting to be half as good as everyone else seems to think we are around the world, <laughs> but we really want, we felt like becoming a national school model. There's something we would lose, especially in the way our schools are student and teacher driven. And there's a lot of shared decision-making at each school site. So the graduate school was part of our desire to make a broader impact. So we do work with um, educators around the country and the globe that are trying to bring more deeper learning, project-based learning with an equity focus to their site. So that's really our model for impact is to support others in building the capacity for them to do the work, the work in their own way that's appropriate for their own context. And we can open up the open up the floor unless Vanessa, did you I heard earlier you maybe had a second question or do we want to turn it over to our other guests? Yes. I mean, if anyone if anyone else has a question, please ask. Yes, Matt. Hi, Kelly. Um, thank you, Vanessa. Um, great presentation. I'm really jazzed about what you guys are doing. It's it's very exciting. I'm, I'm coming to you from an international school in Norway. Um, I guess my question is back to like your first or second slide. So your zip code based lottery, mm -hmm. what, what are your applications like? Like, are you, are you inundated with applications and you can't, you can't get them all in or how, how's that working? And mm -hmm. do people have to express an interest in order for you to, to offer them a pl placement at the school? Mm -hmm. Great questions. Um, when we first started and we had the one high school, we probably had 10 applications to every one spot. So there really was this growing demand within San Diego that we were trying to meet by opening more schools. I still think we have about five applications for every one spot. 
but we already feel like we've maybe grown too big. So we're not planning on opening any more schools. It is a blind zip code lottery. So there is, there's nothing that the students submit as far as writing or as far as grades, but they do have to seek out high tech high to put an application in. So if there's any kind of bias around selection, it would just be the people that come to us, but high tech high is pretty well known across San Diego. Um, but it is people that are interested in exploring a different type of education are involved enough to be like having those conversations and making those decisions um, for their students. But the way the blind zip code works is if you look at the broader San Diego region, we have zip code clusters. And so if there are 8% of students in San Diego live in a certain cluster, then eight of the incoming 100 ninth graders, for example, would be drawn. So it's almost like a bunch of mini lotteries so that mm -hmm. we truly reflect like everything from kids living near the border, Southeast San Diego to the more coastal affluent area. So I was sharing, um, with a colleague here that one of the benefits I found for my children going to high tech high is just how rich the diversity truly is. Um, and that's part of their education to me as much as everything else they're, they're getting from high tech high. Quick follow-up. Do you do a lot of marketing or is it just a spread like wildfire through word mm -hmm. of mouth? Great question. We have done less marketing um, in the beginning, a little bit more now as we have grown and we have more schools just to make sure we're keeping the application numbers up. So we have relationships with a lot of the middle schools. And so we might have a group come out if they want us to do like a, a info session for their eighth graders. We do sometimes send out flyers to families, um, but we've done a very little promotion. Larry Rosenstock, who was our founder and they're the first 20 years really was very, did not want to do a lot of promotion. Like most likely to succeed was not a film that we decided to make. Someone came in, they wanted to make a documentary, but we don't release, you know, our own PR statements. We don't, you know, so a lot of attention kind of came to us and then we were trying to figure out how to manage it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining the questions. Great. Yes, Sasha. All right, thanks. I thank you again for your presentation, Kelly. Um, my husband, Chris, and I are also visiting scholars right now at Laison American School. So we are right upstairs from Kelly, and it's been great to be here with her and talk about things. But after seeing your presentation, and as a teacher educator myself, I just, I have questions around, um, there's a lot of research about the teacher as an observer, right? And they've had a certain understanding of what it means to do school as a student. So what would you say the biggest thing as that you 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 have to like overcome mm -hmm. in training your teachers or reframing mm -hmm. what school is as your teachers join your staff. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful question because we often teach how we were taught. And so there's kind of an unlearning that needs to happen, we found. And that's not only for our new teachers, but I would say teachers, some of, what's even more challenging sometimes than new teachers are veteran teachers that have been teaching a certain way for a long time and then come into teach in our school. So we we do have a new teacher odyssey for um, teachers new to the organization and also the teachers entering our San Diego teacher residency program. And the very first thing we do, and we can't take credit for this, we learned it from expeditionary learning, but we do a two day project slice where from over the course of the two days, as learners, the adults can experience project-based learning. So an example is a, a border, um, slice that we did looking at what it means to live in a border community with San Diego and Mexico and how do different people experience that. So they launch the project, they do some learning related to the project that might include podcasts or looking at primary resources, doing a gallery walk to just kind of get them in a constructivist way, thinking about and learning about the topic. And then we'll do a combination of bringing experts in and then getting them out into the field. So experts coming in, it might be a student that, you know, that travels from the border every day to go to high tech high or a parent from our community. I'm um, getting out in the community. We've gone and met with border angels that really help um, migrant crossing across the border and also the border patrol to see like what they're noticing and experiencing. And then they come back from that field experience and they synthesize their learning and they create a product. So it might, it's different products, different years, um, but they might do their own podcast. They might create a work of visual art and then they have an exhibition of learning at the end of the two days. 
And we design it so that half of the teachers are exhibiting while the other half get to go around and be participants and ask questions. And then we flip it. And then we're looking at, we have kind of a model for project design, but we're from like a metacognition, we're unpacking design and facilitator moves of like why we did things a certain way and having them, not that it's ever done perfectly, we have them respond and how did they experience? So it's a dialogue about the learning while the learning is happening. Um, so there's many other things we do, but I think that one thing is pretty significant and just immediately having people think about learning in a different way if they haven't experienced it themselves. Thank you for that question. Can I can I ask a question? I'm, I'm off screen here, but that's that's okay. Cool. Here, here I am. <laughs> I'm sitting close by. Um, this is Vanessa. This is uh, continuing with your question. So Kelly said that the, there's one of the first schools that's developed a graduate program that's come up out of the K-12. Um, and combining that with your question, Vanessa, I'm wondering. Kelly, if there's any interest of High Tech High helping other schools that have um, unique programming, mm -hmm. um, professional development, research centers, and so on, of, of growing also into this space, which is really new and unique mm -hmm. as an alternative to existing universities, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that question. And we're we're abs absolutely interested in supporting, but also learning from anyone else that is really thinking about higher education in a different way and how we create more integration and proximity between K-12 and higher education and deepen the connections between um, theory and practice. We have done some of that quite a bit. So we've had a number of folks now, um, Relay, Match, Aspire. There's a number um, of folks that have a sim maybe not a similar philosophy in teaching and learning, or school design model, but a similar approach to embedding graduate education in K-12 and they emerged out of. So we share, it was very hard to get accredited. I'm not gonna lie. It was, we had um, a decision point as the small leadership team of, you know, there were three or four of us. I think I was a, a school principal at the time. The other person that was supporting was our chief academic officer at the time. And then Larry was a CEO. <laughs> so it's not, this wasn't any of our full-time jobs when we were trying to get the graduate school started, which was hard in itself. But we thought about, do we want to partner with an existing local university or do we want to go on our own? And we wanted that creativity, autonomy, innovation. And so we took a much longer, harder road. It took nine years to get accredited. We were the first in the nation to come out of K-12. So we had a lot of critique around like, what does graduate culture mean to you? I think they were snuffing out kind of our credibility, like you K-12 people, like <laughs> you think you can run a graduate school, like how is this different than professional learning? So five visits, nine years. Um, but I'm glad we did. I was recently invited to teach at Berkeley. It's taken a year and a half just to get through their like adjunct faculty pool. And then they have to run it by faculty governance. And they're just, the woman who's trying to bring me in is like, I'm so sorry. I know it's not like this at high tech high, but like <laughs> what it takes to get you through the process. And so uh, we're not bogged down by a lot of that bureaucracy that's built up over time in existing institutions. So it's a hard path. So we share, we, we share easily, readily. We want to see more people doing this type of work and we want to learn from how they do it differently and even better than we are. So thanks. Um, I'll ask my other question. So with the rise of artificial intelligence, I was wondering how is high tech high approaching to use AI as a tool, like mm. in the education? Yeah. Yeah. I want, I want to hear from you too, what you're seeing during your college experience, because I'm sure it's um, hitting your generation in different ways too. Um, we've had lots of conversations. We were just talking about this this morning, actually. Um, we have taken a stance of embracing AI. I think it's part of our new reality and it can be a tool to really augment and deepen learning. I think that the risk is that young people or adults, frankly, in our graduate programs are outsourcing their learning and the critical thinking and creativity to AI without using it in conversation and dialogue to augment and deepen their learning. So as faculty last year, um, we just got together and played with AI and we said, let's have it make a lesson plan about this, or let's have it design a project about this, or let's see if it can write an IEP, or let's see how it would do. I'm working on a grant. Let's see how it would do in like getting my grant started. 
And what we found as faculty is as a starting place, it provided something interesting and worthwhile. It took like iterations and conversation with AI of saying, oh, well, can you think about making like a community partnership connection? Or like, how might we think about exhibition? So we do five or six rounds of dialogue with AI till we got something that felt decent. <laughs> and then we take it out of AI and then make it our own. We have had a couple of cases of what I would consider AI plagiarism in the graduate school, where we've had two graduate students submit something that was clearly AI. You know, our faculty ran it through AI generators. There were, um, the student's voice was missing. Examples were missing. Everyone in our graduate school has a professional context. They're e either student teachers in our schools or they're working professionals and our masters in ed leadership from around the world. But you're reflecting on your practice. You're bringing that in. You're making connections to theory that and readings from class. So it's pretty clear when students just boom, throw it in. But if they're using it as a starting place and they're building all that in or an ending place. So I have a daughter who's a senior who's worked really hard on her college essays this fall, did not use AI to my knowledge, but maybe she did. <laughs> but then she got to a point where she was feeling really stuck and she had gotten some feedback from me and from her teacher, but she said, let me see what um, chat GBT will do for critique of my essay. And the feedback was so great. It was like... <laughs> very long. I was surprised. A paragraph just like celebrating strengths in her writing and didn't go straight to feedback. And then it was like, if you'd like to improve your writing, here are three things you might think about. They were not things I had thought about or the teacher, and they were really good, if not better than the critique we had given her. And then it ended with something positive. Um, so I'm really curious about AI as like a form of critique after you've done your own intellectual lifting and thinking and then getting feedback. I think that's interesting. So yeah, but I think it's a part of our life and it's not going away. So how do we um, learn more? But Vanessa, if you don't, if I'm not putting you on the spot, I'm curious what you're seeing and what you're thinking just being a college student right now. Yeah, so I feel like college professors are on a 50-50 stand. Like there are some college professors that are like 100% use AI, obviously as a tool, like mm -hmm. not to plagiarize, but as a starting point, as you said. And there are 50% of the other professors that are super against it, mm -hmm. especially I would say English professors mm -hmm. um, or writing professors. And personally, I think it's a great tool mm -hmm. if you know how to prompt correctly. So I feel like right now what people have to learn is how to prompt. Um, Cause as you said, like you were asking AI like the faculty was asking AI questions, but it took you six tries, right? To get where you wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're very specific and you learn how to ask it questions, mm -hmm. you I think it's a great tool and should be implemented in, in education to, as, to support mm -hmm. um, students in their learnings. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Looks like Sarah's got her digital and physical hand up. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. Um, thank you both, um, Vanessa, for your for your moderation of this. Um, but I, I do have a, a question about um, uh, just trending in terms of what the students go on to do once they've left your schools. Mm -hmm. Do you have any any um, patterns that you notice in the kind of uh, um, the the impact of the type of learning approaches um, mm -hmm. with students who who enjoy student choice and and student agency and what they go on to do afterwards yeah yeah I mean as far as professional contacts and then what they actually do I would say our San Diego teacher residency program the novice teachers are going on to begin their teaching career about 90 percent do start in high-tech high schools um, 10 percent other settings our masters in educational leadership when they're coming to us they're experienced teacher leaders and some are already current administ administrators are working in a district context so i would say that trend still continues where we see from the educational leadership program they're anywhere from teacher leadership instructional leadership coaches principals deans 
Some go on to lead professional learning or do research. So you see kind of a wide array of those outcomes. I think we're trying to get better at understanding. We do have alumni events and bring them back and have conversation. They had their own conference last year where they hosted a conference and then the, the alumni ran it with and for each other online and they all presented different things. So that gave us a flavor. But we're trying to get a better sense of impact on, well, two things. Um, one is what practices might we hope to see still happening after they leave us and how will we know? So we're, we've done some attempt at like survey data and alumni data, it's just really hard to get. So I don't think we have anything that we could say we have like a clear finding on that. The other is residency programs um, are tending to draw uh, a higher percentage of black indigenous and Latinx um, teachers into the field and they're retaining them at higher rates. There's a lot of research from Linda Darling Hammond and Learning Policy Institute. So we do have about 55% identify as BIPOC as compared to only about 20% of the teaching profession in California, 80% identifies as white. So we know that on the preparation side, we're having better outcomes. The, that program is newer. So we're looking at now, we're gonna begin to see in five years, um, whether we're also retaining them at higher levels because there's this revolving door issue of bringing more folks in, but then they leave. Residency programs um, are, have higher retention and higher um, recruitment in part because there's more support during preparation. They do get a $35,000 living stipend that's funded by the California um, Teacher Credentialing Association um, through a grant that we wrote for them. So that provides more access. Um, and then it's a very deep, they're in the schools four days a week, all day long. On Fridays, they're in class together. So it's a very deep immersive with lots of co-teaching opportunities throughout the year. And then they teach a project in the spring. Um, but for retention, we want to make sure that we're not only bringing people in, preparing them well, but they're staying in the field. So I think we have more work to do to, to look at our alumni results and then also build out more support through our alumni network. It's kind of a growth edge and something we're working on. Did that answer your question? I know it was, it went a lot of different ways with it. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think that might be uh, all that we have time for. Um, Vanessa, I want to really thank you for checking in from Hong Kong, uh, for being the awesome student that you were, and according to LinkedIn, are. Uh, mm -hmm. Keep up the good work. Uh, and Kelly for coming all this way from San Diego and spending some time with us and learning with us. Um, same for uh, Chris and Sasha who have come all the way from China. And then all the rest of you who took some time out to uh, join us here to think about um, the high tech high uh, trajectory here and where they might go in the future. I think I have one question that I could leave not for any of us to answer right now, but to think about. The next time there's a, a an excited person about education with deep pockets who pulls together a film crew, uh, what sort of school are they going to make a movie about? What is that school going to look like? What will be the conversation uh, down the road after that movie has made about what that school is doing and how it's positioning itself in the world? Mm. Just uh, just leave us with that, I guess. But yeah. thank, thank you all for, for coming. ECIS, thanks for organizing. And on behalf of the uh, Special Interest Group for Research Informed Schools, uh, very cool that we're able to uh, do this with uh, ECIS. So thank you, yeah. everybody. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you, Vanessa. Such a pleasure thank to sit so with much. you. Thank you, ECIS. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Vanessa. And Paul, thank you for your work in sharing this. Yep. Bye, Thanks Vanessa. Sure.